not Good hearing evening. anything. Good evening. I'm Liz Kruger. Welcome to this week's town hall, navigating the healthcare system in a time of COVID. I'm very glad you can join us tonight. Some of you are listening over the phone. Please remember to keep yourself on mute. This is not designed to be a call in and talk um, town hall. We do have questions in advance we will be getting to later. And if you are watching live on Facebook, you will also be able to type in questions there. We will hopefully be able to get to quite a few of them. Before we go to our guest tonight, I just want to remind everybody that I'm hoping you're staying safe and following all those standard rules we're so tired of hearing, but we have to keep repeating and doing. I hope that you are using a mask when you go outside or in a group that you are not living with and are confident don't have COVID. I hope you are staying six feet away in social distancing and that you are scrubbing your hands with soap and water so much that you wonder if your skin will fall off. It won't really, it will regrow, but the best thing to do is just keep washing your hands, especially if you've been outside or anywhere unusual, and also try to avoid touching your eyes and your face, which is the real challenge when people tell you to do it, you almost want to do it. But here we are, we have survived this far. We are now four days into phase four reopening in New York City. This is an exciting achievement and it is thanks to your perseverance and cooperation and all of our belief that if we follow medicine and science, we stand the best chance of everybody getting through this. Phase four businesses include low risk outdoor arts and entertainment, media production, outdoor professional sports competitions with no fans. Right, so they can play, but you can't sit and watch. You still have to watch them on TV um, or on your computer. Malls, higher education, pre-K to grade 12 schools, however, for safety reasons, have not yet been um, reopened or even decisions made based on safety concerns about whether we're going to be reopening our schools um, and whether we will even know by September if we're reopening our schools. In addition, indoor activities in malls and cultural institutions are not permitted for the time being, but there are wonderful gardens to go to this time of year, and we have parks. And again, same rules. You're going to be near someone, keep the mask on, but enjoy the outdoors. In the meantime, the Department of Education is asking parents to indicate by August 7th if they want their children to learn 100% remotely when schools reopen, or through blended learning, a combination of in-person and online instruction, if that option is available. We are posting a link to the Department of Education survey on the Facebook page. You can also call 718-935-2200 to indicate whether you want your child to learn remotely or to go back into a school. Again, 718-935-2200. Speaking of safety, rules regarding social distancing, face coverings, and travel from states with high infection rates have been established to help to protect the public health and to contain the virus. At this time, there are concerns about crowding and violations of face covering requirements around bars and restaurants. These practices are unsafe and may lead to a certain increase in community transmission of the virus. So if you are a witness to these violations, you can file a complaint on the State Liquor Authority website. We want people to be able to go and participate in our outdoor restaurants but it only works if we don't create a growth in the virus. So everybody who is participating with working at these restaurants or going to these restaurants needs to remember, follow the rules. Because the last thing on earth 
we want to do is have to close all these establishments down, but we can't let them lead us back into a growth in the virus. Additionally, constituents have called my office with concerns about visitors and New York residents who are violating the travel advisory. If you know of someone who has traveled to New York from a designated state, I think there are 31 of them now, and who is not quarantining as required, you can report the travel advisory violation by calling 311 or 1-833-789-0470. I know sometimes people have a feeling that we're almost asking them to tattle on other people, and no one really ever likes to play that role. But again, just to reemphasize, this is real public health crisis stuff. We're not asking you to tell on someone so that you can get them in trouble. We want to make sure they're not getting you sick or someone else sick because they're not following the quarantine rules. We're working so hard to keep everyone safe that we have to all give up a little bit of our own comfort to make sure these rules are followed. All right, to get into this evening's event. Our town hall tonight is addressing navigating the healthcare system in the time of COVID-19. And we've had a bunch of different town halls specific to COVID-19. This topic we think is particularly timely because it's important for us to continue to take care of our healthcare needs during COVID-19, even if we don't think our issues have anything to do with COVID-19. But there's a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty about access and safety and new ways to communicate with doctors and whether or not to go to hospitals and when. And so we're really delighted that Dr. Peter Steele, Director of Clinical Services for the Department of Emergency Medicine at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Wild Cornell. That doesn't even fit on a card, Dr. Steele. Um, that he is with us tonight. Dr. Steele will discuss use of telehealth versus in-office medical appointments, when to get your health care needs taken care of, deciding on whether to go to the emergency room, and whether or not you should be going for COVID-19 testing. I know that I just saw a report that doctors are very concerned parents aren't necessarily having their kids vaccinated because they weren't really doing regular office visits um, during the time that everybody was just staying locked up in their houses. So I know that that's one of the issues that people will probably be asking about. Before I introduce our presenter, please remember, keep your lines on mute if you're on the phone. After the presentation, I will moderate a Q&A and again, as I told you, we have questions already submitted in advance, and you can also submit your questions through Facebook. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Steele, who will be giving a presentation, and then I will be coming back to join him. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I just want to kind of begin by wholeheartedly endorsing your public health announcements. They are absolutely in line with how we feel as, as physicians, the public should be approaching COVID-19. So thank you for that. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Terrific. So to um, all of the listeners, um, my name is Dr. Peter Steele. Um, I am the Director of Clinical Services for the Emergency Department, as Senator Kruger outlined. And so we, um, the leadership team of the ED has been, like you, in the eye of the COVID storm um, over the past few months. Um, and uh, we got through it very well. I'm very proud of the team. Um, and I'm also very proud of the public. Um, because this has been an incredibly difficult time for an, all New York citizens. Um, and I think that what I want to offer today, um, what I'd like you to leave this, this hour, is feeling a little bit more secure about how to navigate the healthcare system, what the do's and don'ts are. Um, a lot of do's, very little don'ts. 
Um, what I don't think we can do is to leave you with a comprehensive, definitive understanding of COVID. And the reason for that is because the scientists yet have a comprehensive, definitive understanding of COVID. And that is understandably provoking a degree of insecurity um, in the public's mind and hopefully a thirst for information. So my first point would be what should a, a member of the public do in this time is remain engaged. Um, remain engaged with, with your civil leaders and remain engaged with healthcare leaders. So I thank you for being here. I think it's, it's the right move in this time um, of a shifting landscape of COVID um, and public health announcements. Um, so being engaged is, is the most important thing. Um, so I think one of the first questions as an emergency physician leader I want to engage you with is a question I've heard many times, both from friends and from um, patients is, when should I go to the emergency department? Should I be here today? Um, and I want to give you the context that the American Heart Association and um, stroke leadership nationally is concerned that people have not been coming to emergency departments for medical emergencies during this time of COVID. Um, so we would like people to use the emergency department as they typically would for medical emergencies. So concerning symptoms would include stroke-like symptoms, uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, severe abdominal pain, high fevers, uh, drowsiness, confusion, falls, severe trauma. The type of complaints that would provoke you to go to the emergency department should still provoke you to go to the emergency department now. And I think the obvious subsequent questions are, are you sure the ED is safe? And maybe less so now, but certainly in the peak of COVID, are, are emergency departments not overwhelmed with COVID patients? Are you sure? There are some patients that almost have been apologizing for coming to the ED, imagining that, that there, are, there are more important things to do than look after patients without COVID. Um, fortunately for New York City, for now, the majority of COVID patients um, have passed through the ED. And so um, even in our peak, we had perfect capability to look after everybody with an acute medical emergency. And all the more so now, our volume is actually below what our typical volume is. So I'm proud to say that we can give the, the optimal amount of care. Um, we we'll probably spend more time per patient than we have done historically. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to view the ED as, as optimized to deliver care whether we would want to. Um, in terms of the safety, yes, it is safe. Um, and let me talk you through why it is safe. As providers at my institution, we are screened daily before we're allowed to access our own healthcare center, our own place of employment. Patients are screened on arrival to the emergency department. Visitors accompanying patients are screened on arrival to the emergency department. Visitors with warning symptoms or who screen positive potentially having COVID and not allowed to be visitors anymore, unfortunately. Um, and patients who screen positive for concerning COVID-like symptoms or risk for having COVID based on travel um, are, are placed in a separate area in the emergency department to the rest of patients. They are masked and full precautions are placed for those patients. So right from arrival in the emergency department, we are screening and then dividing patients from COVID to non-COVID. In terms of how we manage patients in the emergency department, there's a diverse array of interventions that we've done to try and reduce spread within the healthcare system, including taking away the rating room. So there's very little places where patients can crowd next to each other. We've leveraged infrastructure like telemedicine so we can have touchless encounters with patients. Nursing checking in on patients in the ED can do so by a telemedicine, by a video screen. And I'll show you the next slide as to what that would look like. Um, we've also leveraged opportunities inside the hospital to make sure all providers are masked at all time, all staff in fact are masked at all time, to really reduce any spread. And I think that sometimes what I've seen is um, some patients being somewhat concerned by the amount of patients wearing masks as if COVID was everywhere. Um, the main reason we're using full precautions for all staff members and all patients in the emergency department have to wear a mask is as much as the healthcare system is separate from the community, community spread can still occur in a healthcare system. So we take the concept of community spread 
just as seriously in the hospital as you should at home. So that's the emergency department. We would very much like people to view the emergency department as open for business and safe. And that we have made changes to the emergency department to accommodate COVID patients and to mitigate against the risk of community spread in the emergency department. And if I haven't covered anybody's detailed questions on the emergency department, I could probably spend five hours talking about the emergency department. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more. Just to talk about general hospital workflows, though, um, patients are coming to the ED and are being admitted to hospital with COVID. So how are we making sure it's safe for the next patient that comes along? Our environmental services team is one of the most crucial team members in managing COVID in a hospital, doing detailed deep cleaning and decontamination of any room where a COVID patient was managed and all equipment. So you can be guaranteed that if someone puts a blood pressure cuff on you um, or, or, or someone offers you um, a, a gown, um, that, um, that nothing has been touched by a COVID patient that is perishable and that everything that we reused has gone through deep decontamination um, and there's zero possibility of them having COVID on it. Uh, so I feel, feel very strong about that. Um, Hospital-wide precautions are pretty much the same. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the clinics and telehealth, um, but all of this visitor screening and patient screening is the same across the institution. So in addition to emergency medicine, I definitely want to spend a little bit more time making you feel confident, confident about telehealth and the emerging concepts of telehealth and how we use telehealth to deliver care in 2020. So what is telehealth? Telehealth is the remote delivery of healthcare using a variety of technological infrastructures. And that can be a video screen like the one I'm talking on. It can be a telephone. It can be satellite. It can be transmission of information, medical information through your cell phone. Um, so it's a delivery of care remotely using technology. Why have we invested in this over the past 10 years? Well, we think it increases patient access. We think it can reduce costs to patients as well. And we think that it can improve patient experience all at the same time. In the setting of COVID, this was obviously perfect infrastructure to deliver care remotely. Uh, it allowed for social distancing restrictions without having to worry about things like a waiting room. Um, patients didn't have to travel to go and see a doctor. And so we advanced this concept of a zero contact care encounter with a physician. In terms of how our physicians have been trained, we've retrained our physicians extensively um, in advanced history taking skills and examination skills. And you can do a surprisingly comprehensive exam on a patient over a video screen, coaching the patient through their own examination, checking their pulse, pushing on their abdomen, checking their temperature. We can write prescriptions. We can refer patients onto other services if necessary. And if you are sicker than you thought you were for telemedicine, we can refer you directly to our emergency department. And while you are en route to the emergency department, we can call our colleagues to let them know the details of the case so you'll be met on arrival. We leveraged this tremendously through COVID. Um, our leadership of, of telehealth uh, through the emergency department and across the whole New York Presbyterian enterprise was critical um, in our institution's COVID response. Um, and it's good because we've learned a lot through that experience, and I think the patient has gained increasing confidence in this new technology, this new form of healthcare. And we would encourage you to continue to use telehealth infrastructure for your continued care. And so what sort of cases should you use the, our telehealth platform for? Our express care, which is like an urgent care or a city MD, if you will, um, it's appropriate for things like small minor injuries, bites, abrasions. It's also appropriate for medication refills, evaluation of oral complaints like toothaches, maybe more social issues like needing a work note, and dermatological conditions where the diagnosis can pretty much be visual, things like rash or concern for an insect bite or an allergy. That is what I would encourage you to use the telehealth platform for. There are other uses for the telehealth platform, for example, follow-up clinic visits or primary care visits. I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail later. 
So what would you need to prepare for a telehealth encounter? Well, you'll, you'll need a, a cell phone or a laptop, a smartphone or a laptop. Um, you'll need to check, make sure that the, the, the technology works, that you can sign on, um, and that the lighting in the room is good enough for someone like me, your physician, to look at your rash or to have good contact with you. Um, and you may need to be prepared to help the doctor do things like check, check vital signs. Uh, so please be open to a remote physical exam. In terms of information that you can prepare prior to having the encounter, we would like you to make sure you had your regular medication list with you, that you prepare your medical history, thinking through what surgeries you have and what active medical problems you've had, and to think a little bit about the symptoms that are concerning you in detail so that you can give us as accurate information about why you're concerned about your health before we start the encounter. I added a few slides uh, just to show you how to log on to our New York Presbyterian app. Uh, you can search it in any app store. For, for Apple, that's an app store. For, for Android devices, that's the Google Play Store. And you can download the New York Presbyterian app, which is a general app. Once you've launched the app, it will bring you straight to a uh, platform where you can select virtual urgent care. You can then decide whether it's a COVID-related visit or not, whether you're an adult or a pediatric, what state from, because we are also serving New Jersey, Connecticut, and Florida. Should, should it be patients down there if you have family members? And then you can select a provider to see. So we can answer if, that's, if, that, is, if that is a too shallow a description of the telehealth platform, or if you have additional questions about other, other uses of telehealth platform, that would be appropriate for the Q&A. Now, in terms of getting you more confident about your health, you may think, but I, I don't have a medical emergency, and I, and I don't think I have something trivial enough to use our urgent care on-demand platform for. So can I just go to my doctor, or I don't have a doctor, but can I just go to a clinic? So I'd like to use this five minutes to talk to you a little bit through that sort of problem. So yes, our clinics are open, and the majority of clinics across New York City are open. And they have a similar staff and patient safety protocols to the ones I described in the emergency department, including decontamination, provider screening, patient screening, and visitor screening. So I feel very comfortable that when the clinic that you used to go to uh, calls you for a follow-up check-in appointment, a six-month or one-year appointment, you should absolutely go. Um, as Senator Kruger alluded to, we absolutely want children and adults getting their immunizations. So please don't stay at home for those needs. Appropriate visits include regular checkups, but also chronic complaints, things like chronic pain where you don't think you necessarily need to go to the emergency department, long-standing issues such as weight loss, um, loss of appetite, things of that nature would, I think, are very reasonable. Reassessments of chronic conditions, blood pressure, diabetes, critical disease states like that, renal problems, kidney problems. And then evaluations for referrals. It may be that you don't know the right orthopedic surgeon, so going to your primary care physician will help facilitate an appropriate referral for specialty care if you're not comfortable doing that yourself. In this screen, I put up the link to our services at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell. Uh, we have a host of primary care adult internal medicine services, and they do offer video visits. I will caution you that the video visit is most appropriate for patients already established. It's not quite the right encounter for a first-time appointment. So for those of you that are established in New York Presbyterian, please feel free to use the video visit platform. That's telehealth for primary care and even specialty care. Um, for those new visitors, I would say the first visit should probably be in person, and then you can transition to video visits. There are elements to a first-time visit with a doctor that really need a full physical exam, as well as blood taking. Video clinic visits are also available for specialties, and I put this up, um, including this number, um, so that you know where to go in terms of online and, and phone numbers to contact to find out whether your gastroenterologist or your cardiologist or your vascular surgeon will see you via video visit this year if you New York Presbyterian. A lot of them are, so please check. Moving away slightly from New York Presbyterian, perhaps there's not a New York Presbyterian hospital near where you live, perhaps you're more familiar with another institution, 
So how do you figure out testing sites and care sites across New York City? I would push you strongly to go to ny.gov website. They have a fantastic platform which enables you to figure out where to go for COVID testing, where to go to antibody testing, um, and which healthcare facilities are open. New York Gov has all that information to help you determine as well if you need testing, if you have questions. People who think that they might have symptoms, I would suggest that you go to New York Presbyterian Emergency Department or your nearest possible emergency department. If you don't think you have symptoms, I would suggest that you call your primary care physician or establish a new primary care physician or go to an urgent care. And that is exactly what the nyc.gov um, website portal is for, is for you to decide where to go, which facilities offer testing for the antigen, the active infection, and which facilities offer testing for the antibody. And I can go through in our Q&A um, how you would determine which of those two things you need if that's unclear to you based on your knowledge so far. Advice for people for COVID symptoms in general is immediately limit your contact with anyone else, wear a mask at all times, and if you have symptoms, go to the emergency department. If you feel like it's going to be problematic getting there yourself, call 911 and have an ambulance take you there. No symptoms, again, just to summarize, primary care physician or establish a new primary care physician or go to an urgent care that does as testing identifiable on this website, nyc.gov. So, Senator Kruger, I think that's the end of my slides. Um, Perfect, because I was going to say, we're just at the time that we scheduled to jump into questions. And as I said, I have quite a few here. And if people have additional that they would like to type into Facebook, um, they'll get transferred over to um, for me to be able to read them to Dr. Steele. And we'll try to get through as many as we can. I also just want to emphasize Dr. Steele's presentation was specific to how you access um, healthcare at the Columbia Presbyterian Cornell, while Cornell system. And that makes sense. That's where he's a doctor. But I also just want to assure people, pretty much all the major hospitals in my district have also gone to a parallel system um, for their ERs and for telehealth. Everybody's is slightly different. But don't, or so assume if your doctors are affiliated with a different hospital on the east side of Manhattan, you probably can access very similar, if not identical, services for yourself that way. Um, so, all right, let's just jump into some questions, doctor. So you just closed down, you just finished talking about the COVID-19 testing and how people can get access to it. People want to know, are these results trustworthy? Are there different kinds of tests that are better or worse? Some you can get the answers right away. Some you can't get the answers for days and days. Well, the, the more I have heard um, from experiences in the community or from colleagues working in other institutions, uh, the more I realize that community testing is still um, the Wild West, frankly. Um, there, I've heard stories of, of turnaround times of eight to 11 days for a test result um, compared to one or two days. For us, it's a day. Sometimes if patients don't want to come to our facility, we use an outside vendor um, like, like Quest um, or, or ProLab, and, and they take about three days, but I've heard up to 11 days. So definitely turnaround times are still very variable. And just when in New York, uh, th those turnaround times were beginning to equilibrate, um, COVID exploded in other states. So we're in competition with other states to get these reagents, to get this equipment to do testing. Uh, and so just as it started to stabilize in New York, it became unstable again because of the demands across other states. In terms of the quality of tests, um, most of these tests are above 85% sensitivity, so they'll capture it. So it's not a great test. Um, it can be wrong. Um, and, and there are obviously literature is coming out every week about the different companies um, that, 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 
that offer these tests and that they have superior specificity or sensitivity. I think, again, uh, that is a, a, a shaky landscape, so I wouldn't want to comment or commit to saying this test is superior to that test. Um, I would just say that there are false negatives um, in for all of the vendors, and so repeat testing, at least in our institution, is part of our culture for high-risk patients. So, what about non-emergency surgery? Is it okay to go back to hospitals or the outpatient um, physical setups where they do hip replacement, knee replacement? Um, you know, people put them off for months and months, and they're not emergency. But if you need a hip replacement, you're you're in a lot of pain. Is it is it time to reschedule things like that? I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that. So in addition to it being wholly appropriate for you to pursue emergency medical needs, um, chronic medical needs, particularly surgeries, as Senator Kruger is alluding to, it, this is as good a time as any. Um, the volume of New York City is down, and so uh, surgeons will be laser focused on reestablishing their practices. Um, and and from a, a patient safety standpoint, as I went through. Uh, the, the decontamination and the screening tests that are in place for patients pre-surgically ensure a very high level of safety. So I would encourage anybody that was thinking about pursuing a non-urgent surgical process, this summer and fall would be a great time to initiate that. And how about some of the diagnostic tests, especially as we get to certain ages that were advised, mammograms, colonoscopies. Um, people are a little nervous about, you know, Putting, using anesthesia and being sedated because um, all they hear about COVID is that how it you know infects your lungs and triggers yes. all kinds of problems. Is it also okay to, for us to go back to those kinds of diagnostic tests? Yes, for all the same reasons. For, for, for the screening that would need to happen before those tests were done, before you would be allowed to do that. And this isn't just in New York Presbyterian. This is, as you said earlier on, this is really across the city um, those techniques have been refined, so I think that um, even even diagnostic testing that's not emergent should be this would be considered a good time, not just not just a back to normal time to do it, but a good time to do that. And in terms of recovery, things like intubations, you said being placed on a respirator for a, for, for a surgical procedure or a heavy diagnostic procedure, um, I, I don't think that, uh, that, that that the COVID era changes. Uh, that risk factor profile. Why? Because we screen patients and we separate COVID patients um, from, from, from the rest of the hospital population. So if you're going to a hospital or a healthcare facility for this, uh, you'll be safe. So this wouldn't be hospital setting, but people ask, is it safe to go have your eyes checked? Is it safe to go to your dentist for exams and cleanings? Do we think that sort of everybody is caught up in healthcare? what you were describing the protocols are well yes i i think that um i think that i would encourage everybody to ask the right questions though when they attend small clinics maybe um you know everybody should be masked staff and and any guests at those facilities um but i certainly think as long as the appropriate precautions of masking um are are being performed uh, and the patients are being screened on arrival for not having COVID-like symptoms, um, then, then that is wholly appropriate and safe. Uh, but, but the community should be vigilant to ask those questions and they should feel empowered and confident to ask those questions. So jumping back to when you were describing um, people getting tests or coming into the ER if they think they have symptoms, can you go to your hospital to get a test? Do you offer tests like on a walk-in basis or do you encourage people to go other locations? The, the patients I would encourage to walk in to be tested are patients with symptoms and I would encourage them to walk into the emergency department to be tested. If you have, if you're manifesting actual symptoms of COVID, it's possible that you could be sicker than you realize and so we would want to screen you. Patients who have no symptoms, patients who are just looking to be screened either for the antigen, the active infection, or, or the antibody, which we're calling serology testing, which is evidence that you have, have come in contact uh, with the infection. Um, if you have no symptoms, I would suggest that you either go to your primary care physician, uh, which is usually pre-scheduled. At, at, at our facility, 
we are mostly doing scheduled appointments, so you would call in advance. Uh, there may be some institutions that are doing walk-in clinics still. We were in the peak of COVID, but that's not something we're accommodating currently. Um, and uh, and uh, urgent cares. Um, so some urgent cares across the city, and you can check again on nyc.gov which urgent cares they will be, are offering walk-in testings. Um, I would say, though, that, again, it's a little Wild West, so you may go to get testing, and um, you may find you're waiting a week for the results, which is frustrating, and understandably so. So I would maybe call ahead and ask them what their turnaround time is before you commit to going to an urgent care center. Same for your primary care clinics. Our turnaround time is about 24 hours, but I would call ahead to your established PCP to get a sense of what their turnaround time is. Great. And we were talking a little bit, I think, before we went on air about how we keep learning new things, so the information keeps changing, and that's a challenge, especially for doctors. Um, but I was—I think it was even in the New York Times today that now they are pretty sure if you've already had COVID you, and you have tested positive for the antibodies, you probably won't get it again. Is that a fair statement? Is, can I say that now? I, I, I am very reluctant to make definitive comments on the immunity conferred by having tested positive for COVID. Because don't forget, some of the some of the testing positive can be that just that you come in contact with the with the antigen with the virus itself, um, and the, and 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 it doesn't really necessarily predict how primed your immune system is for another encounter. And there are people that are that are also for those of you that have been reading astutely on this will realize there's more to immunity than just antibodies. There's things like cytotoxic T cell immunity, and, and antibody levels can go down to an undetectable or baseline level but then um, spike up again if you meet the infection. So having low antibody levels doesn't necessarily mean you're not immune. So, so it's a com immunity is a complicated science. We are early in our phases of understanding how COVID-19 immunity occurs and for how long it would last. Um, so I am still not ready to commit to an idea of, does someone who's had COVID subsequently immune? Not ready to commit. And, and, and I think, the, the, the next area of instability is even when we do get a sense of, of early immunity, how long that immunity lasts is unclear, both because sometimes your immune system can forget viral immunity. Also, viruses can mutate and change in a way where you're going to have to learn the virus again and suffer through it again to get it. So, so we're still not stable enough to make good recommendations about full immunity. So I apologize, you know, I apologize, and again, the message here is to stay vigilant, read information from resources that you can trust, uh, and remain engaged. All right, so one that just came in over Facebook, how would someone who has tested positive for COVID know that they should go to the emergency room for care? Is there some standard of how sick you feel when you already know you have COVID that should trigger going, or is that when you get on your telemedicine call with your doctor? That's a, that's a great question. So I think um, sick people know when they're sick. So if you feel sick, I wouldn't delay it with a, um, a telehealth call. Uh, if you feel sick, if you feel short of breath, if you're not able to finish your sentences, people say, well, how short of breath is short of breath? If, you, if you're having to take a breath in between a sentence, if you're struggling to walk the normal distance you walk, um, that is concerning enough to come to the emergency department. Chest pain would be another symptom. Confusion that that's normal for you. Unable to stay awake for periods of time. Sick people know when they're sick. But you're right to ask this question because there's that gray zone where you may have, was I short of breath this past couple of hours? I can't be sure. Should I go straight into the emergency department? That is why I love telehealth, telehealth as a resource. If you use Tele On Demand app, you can have be seen by a provider who will walk you through a physical exam, will check how many seconds you're breathing a minute, um, and then we'll decide together as a team, yourself and the, and, and the provider, whether you should go to the emergency department next. But I think if you have any doubts, uh, please come to the emergency department. One other device that can be helpful to keep at home is the oxygenation sat monitor. 
Now, these sat monitors you can put on your finger and you can judge your oxygen saturation. They're not perfect devices. The very expensive ones are very good, but the majority of ones you can buy on, say, Amazon are not perfect devices. I, for example, asked my parents to get them. Uh, they're not that accurate at low oxygen saturations, but that doesn't really matter because if it reads low, I really want you in the emergency department for an evaluation. If it reads high, you can remain reassured. Not reassured enough to not seek the care of a provider. If you have any symptoms, you should seek care of a provider, either in the ED, through telehealth, or through primary care. Um, but getting one of those oxygen sat monitors can be a good way to monitor your symptoms at home. So we know that COVID attacks all kinds of body parts, and it's clearly an attack on the immune system. People want to know, can they do something in advance to strengthen their own immune system? Are there any specific foods they should be eating or supplements they should be taking? I guess you're always supposed to exercise <laughs> and get stronger. There are no, I have no specific recommendations unique to COVID-19, but I have strong recommendations in this poll, which is good natural foods, fruit, vegetable, good natural proteins. I love fish, I love chicken, salmon particularly. It's easy to cook in the summer. Um, exercise is important also. Um, one thing that I think is often underlooked is stress management. I think, you know, we're all under a lot of pressure right now. People working from home, managing childcare at home, um, worried about their elderly loved ones getting sick, uh, people away from their loved ones to prevent spread of anything. And I think that can be incredibly stressful. And people who are stressful, that has an amazing physiological effect on us. It leaves us run down just as much as eating bad food and smoking cigarettes and drinking too much alcohol. Um, so so I, I would urge people to engage with stress management techniques. Um, and that can be deep breathing exercises. I love the beginner meditation app, Calm. Um, I love the beginner meditation app, Headspace. I like talking techniques. So associating with friends, making time with friends on Zoom, making the right phone calls, spending time, even if it's remotely, using your phone with loved ones um, to reduce stress. So I think that's, that's under-talked about. And while we're talking about stress, stress often provokes in people learned behaviors, such as drinking a little bit more than they typically would, or if they've done an excellent job giving up smoking over the past few years, smoking again. I would urge people that now would be, absolutely be the time to stop smoking, and you can reach out to our primary care services to gain support in that. And absolutely not a time to overdrink. So healthy, balanced diet, exercise, and then big flash, stress management, and then avoiding toxic habits. See, so you were highlighting good time not to overdrink. One of the detailed questions is, you're trying to maneuver just walking down the sidewalks with people who are over drinking, don't have their masks on, and are probably also smoking. So the question mm -hmm. is, well, we know why smoking is terrible for us, but their question was, does secondhand smoke actually transfer um, the disease? It's almost the description is, are the particles lingering in the smoke? Um, and, and so if you're walking down a block and a whole bunch of people are standing there smoking and drinking without their masks, right. are you at higher risk just walking down the route yes. of smoke? I liked that question. I read that question and I liked it. Yeah. And I liked it for two reasons, because I don't have a real science-based answer, but I have an answer. So no one knows. But I think it's comfortable to say that that's an unknown that I would steer away from. That would, you're describing a high-risk unknown. Um, and so I, would, I, I don't have a definitive answer, but I do. And my definitive answer is, that sounds risky to me. Please avoid it. And again, don't forget, everyone, secondhand smoke is terrible for you, period, even if we weren't going through a COVID crisis. So you want to avoid um, inhaling other people's cigarette smoke as much as you can always, and by staying away from people, frankly, who are smoking. I mean, it's particularly disturbing in inside places, but we pretty much outlawed smoke, outlawed smoking everywhere indoors at this point in time, unless it's your own apartment. So I think, thank you, you're right. It's just, I almost feel like it's common sense, even if I don't know the facts, to want to not be 
hanging around people smoking while they're also at risk of transferring a virus at the same time. Um, a virus that also impacts the lungs, so it's really not something you want to be playing with at all. Right. Okay, so now this is a question they say it's for me, but if you have an answer, that's fine too. Um, about elevators in residential buildings, um, the description is a cesspool, cesspool of COVID germs. Besides a mask and holding my breath for 19 floors, that's pretty good if you can hold your breath for 19 floors. Um, is there anything building owners could do specifically to minimize the dangers of the virus? And I and it's not, I mean, I don't, you might have some suggestions, but I do know some of the buildings are working hard to ensure they are cleaning out their ventilation systems and using HIPAA filters in their air ventilation systems. So in theory, that would also apply to their elevators if they could be careful to be with the ventilation system. Agreed. Um, and of course the obvious, um, only one person in the elevator at time at a time or combine if, it, if you're walking with your partner outside right. then you can be riding the elevator together so the, yes your your suggestion and and the the, the the single occupancy of the two the two answers I have to that and I was also going to say that you know some people walk around with gloves others don't seems to me if you're going to be carrying some rubber gloves mm -hmm. that would be the right time to use them to press the buttons or to touch the doors if you need to rather than you know worry about it so try to avoid touching anything that's a surface that you're not sure about or washing your hands not everybody has rubber gloves so 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 disinfecting curelling your hands after right. touching something outside of your home is, is is a reasonable alternative and as you correctly said at the beginning um not touching your face not touching your eyes or your mouth until you've got home uh, which is tricky for some of us, I think, it's a, a sort of learned habit, um, yeah. Right, and thank you for bringing up the Purell. I completely forgot about that. We've sort of stopped talking about that, that, you know, sort of building that into your just, your daily life of having a little bottle with you when you're out. And when in doubt, you know, use some Purell. Yeah. It makes total sense. So then they're asking me whether I think the New York Health Act will get more sponsors in Albany because of COVID. I actually think the answer is yes, because it's waking people up to the critical need to make sure everybody has insurance coverage and access to good health care. Um, at the same time, it's almost an overwhelming challenge to take it on at the same time as we are all dealing with COVID. Um, I will suggest to my constituents to watch carefully what happens in the courts now that some legislators from other states from a party I'm not affiliated with have decided to go back into court and try to get the ACA law overturned. Um, because the concept that in the middle of a national and international pandemic, there are people who would think it's a good idea to end the healthcare system and insurance system we have, can seems to me to be completely ass backward. Um, so that might trigger the New York Healthcare Act because we will have lost our federal coverage. But I, you know, I think advocates just have to keep pushing on that, and we keep having to have broader and broader discussions about how we could do it. Right now, I do not believe the Trump administration would give us any of the waivers um, or allow us to keep our Medicaid funding, which would make this almost impossible. So it's a politically very difficult challenge for us. Um, but I don't give up on the belief that much of the Civilized world has national health care and it's been working fine for them. And I think we can get there. That's my belief. I, Doctor, I don't know whether you have any opinions about national health care. I concur. Thank you. All right. And the last question I see here has nothing to do with health care. It's about helicopters hovering overhead all the time, day and night. 
Um, the question is, what good are they for keeping peace when they make the neighborhoods more noisy? I agree. I don't think the helicopters have any role in keeping the peace. And for the record, while there continue to be protests in many communities, including my own, they are peaceful protests. And we really have not had any need for emergency intervention now pretty much for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I'm not sure why we keep putting those helicopters up there because really all they do is create more noise. Um, so I don't think it's at a level of medical crisis that the helicopters are up there, but I do think they should just go back to where they're supposed to sit on the ground until they're needed for something. And I see one more question. I've heard that you need to arrive in the ER in an ambulance to get treated immediately. Is that true? Uh, strong no, strong no to that. Um, I think that's a that's a legacy perspective from maybe a, a generation past. Um, I'm proud to say that the triage really across the city is outstanding. Other states come to our state to learn about emergency medicine triage. And whether you walk in or whether you come in by ambulance, there is a science-based way to do initial assessment. And then the patient is subsequently triaged based on the severity of their vital signs, their complaint, and then initial point of care testing we do on arrival. And I think most of the emergency departments, if not all of the emergency departments in New York City follow the same way. So um, if, you can, if you can get in quicker uh, via personal transport, go right ahead. I would say, though, that if you have extremely concerning symptoms, stroke-like symptoms, or severe chest pain, um, that you should probably just call an ambulance because I wouldn't want you deteriorating in transit. Um, so very severe symptoms, call 911 no matter what. And of course, if you're having those kinds of symptoms, the people on the ambulance can often start to provide treatment to you even before you've gotten to the ER. So yes, diagnosis and treatment and can route you to an appropriate ER. There are stroke centers and chest pain centers. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you'll go to an ER with the, and a hospital with the capabilities to look after your specific complaint. Exactly, exactly. So yes, please don't. And I find it's fascinating. People don't think to just call an ambulance when they're clearly in an emergency, but sometimes you're not thinking clearly during the emergency, which is half the battle of getting you to just make that call. Um, but yes, I have dealt with my parents in those situations where they've, they've passed now, but as they got older and they were having medical issues and they'd call me, I go, did you call 911? No, not yet. No, no, no. 911 is the first call, then you know, your, your, your daughter 10 blocks away is the second call. And even then, I couldn't get them to understand just press 911 because the emergency almost freezes you from being able to make the right decision. So I, I appreciate your bringing that up because I do want to emphasize if you think you're in the middle of something serious going on, you just call 911. If they get there and it's not really an emergency, They'll tell you when they won't take you to the hospital. It's okay. Far, far better that you made that call and somebody rushed in to do something, um, right? Not, not you know, sit there and say, oh, I don't want to be a bother. <laughs> right? It will be a bother to someone if you just pass in your home when you could have gotten emergency medical care. With yes. that, yes. All right, I think we have actually come to the time where I thank you very much for being with you, with us tonight. Really appreciate your taking time off from, I'm sure, what is a crazy schedule, um, being responsible for what you are responsible in your professional life. Um, I know that people learned a lot. I want to remind everyone that they can watch this on Facebook whenever they like, and I think also on my Senate website, LizKruger.com. My next virtual town hall will be about the intersection of ageism and ableism in the time of COVID. We'll all look that up before Thursday, August 6th from 7 to 8 p.m. I'll be joined by Ashton Applewhite, 
who's a fabulous author and ageism activist, and Peter Slatten, founder and president of Slatten Group and a disability rights advocate. So stay well, stay safe, wear a face mask, wash your hands, cover your nose and mouth, stay six feet away from other people, and then just do the best you can to go on with your life, and we will all get past this eventually. So again, thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good night, everyone.